The manga starts by introducing Haruka, the main character, who gets transported to another world. He tells how it happened while he was sitting in class, reading a book. He usually kept to himself and only hung out with the geeks. Suddenly, a magic circle appears in the classroom, and Haruka realizes he's about to enter a different world. But he knows that dealing with alternate worlds can be really troublesome. He then kept trying to get out of the class. Haruka realized he couldn't escape through the windows, so he tried the attic instead. But to his surprise, he ended up in a completely white room where he met an old man. The old man explained that everyone else had already been transported to the other world as a group, but somehow, Haruka ended up in a different place. The old man then asked if Haruka had escaped from his classroom. Haruka proudly confirmed it and even teased the old man for not noticing his escape. The old man told Haruka that it was okay that he had arrived there. Haruka felt disappointed because he thought he had managed to escape. However, the old man explained that if Haruka hurried to find his classmates, they could still join forces. But there was a catch. He had to quickly choose his skills and it was first come, first served. Haruka felt let down that the old man reassured him that there might be some good skills left. Unfortunately, when the old man checked the available skills, it were all taken. It turned out that Haruka only had 50 points to allocate his stats, or he could try rolling a dice, which required 10 points for two dice. In terms of equipment, he was given a villager, a set, and contact lenses. Haruka received cane arts as his bestowed skill, which he found very disappointing. Haruka received several skills like health, walking, exercise, and sensitivity. For magic, he got temperature, packing, weight, and movement. His special traits were Horenso, unproductiveness, and uselessness. Additionally, he was given the titles Shut In and Meet. Upon learning about his stats, Haruka felt disheartened realizing that he wouldn't even be able to clear the tutorial village in a typical RPG. Despite that, the old man then transported Haruka into the other world, and he suddenly found himself in the middle of a forest. Haruka couldn't help but wonder what the old man was thinking when he casually sent him to another world without any preparation. It would have been nice to have some time to get ready and gather equipment for the journey. As he ventured through this new world, Haruka stumbled upon a bag and decided to open it. Inside, he discovered his own costume and promptly put it on. After donning the villager A costume, Haruka actually found it quite appealing and thought he looked like a hero wearing it. He also hoped that his stats wouldn't be too bad with this title. The old man encouraged him to roll the dice, and when he did, both dice showed M. Haruka worried it might mean Minus or Masochist, but the old man assured him that it couldn't be something like that. Curious about how he should allocate his stats, the old man asked Haruka for his decision. Feeling helpless with his current strength, Haruka chose to focus on luck. He believed it might be his best chance of surviving in this challenging situation since he had no hope in his current abilities. Haruka then went all in and allocated all of his points to luck. However, he still had a bad feeling about it. After allocating his points to luck, Haruka's luck reached its maximum capacity. He finally understood that the two M's from earlier actually meant maximum capacity. However, he couldn't help but notice that the rest of his skills seemed pretty useless. To his dismay, Haruka learned that the loner title he received meant he couldn't form or join a party and had to survive all alone. Moreover, with his manipulation skills, he could only control minions and underlings, not real teammates. This realization was like living in a hellish situation for him, as all he wanted was to go on a journey with his friends. Adding to his worries, Haruka hadn't seen any of his classmates who were also transported to this world. Realizing that he couldn't form a party with his classmates, even if he found them, Haruka decided to handle the situation by himself. His top priority was to find shelter and food. However, he was worried about his ability, dozing off, and whether he could survive if a monster suddenly attacked him. Thankfully, he remembered the contact lenses he received earlier. When he put them on, his vision became clear, and to his surprise, he could see all the information he needed. It turned out that just by wearing the contact lenses, he had learned the skill, inspection, which allowed him to gather valuable information. Haruka discovered that his bag had an incredible capacity, allowing him to store as many materials and medicines as he wanted. He felt remorseful for underestimating the usefulness of the Villager A title, and for once began to feel optimistic about his situation. As he continued exploring, something caught his attention and shone brightly. Curious, Haruka followed the light and stumbled upon a river. Thirsty, he drank from the river and instantly felt refreshed. Afterwards, he found himself standing before a massive cave. As Haruka ventured into the cave, he hoped there wouldn't be any monsters lurking inside. To his surprise, the cave turned out to be completely empty. He noticed its wide and comfortable interior, which put him at ease. As he checked the items in his bag, he discovered a magic tent that could open and close automatically when powered by magic. The tent was also temperature controlled and had the added benefit of repelling bugs and monsters. Additionally, he found a magic lantern that could be brightened, dimmed, or extinguished using magic power. Similar to the tent, the lantern also served as a repellent against bugs and monsters. He then set up the firewood he had gathered earlier. After using temperature magic to ignite the firewood, Haruka felt a sense of accomplishment and learned from the events of the day. Before going to sleep, he decided to check his status. He was delighted to see that his temperature magic had improved, 
and he now possessed fire magic as well. Additionally, his keen observation skills had earned him the Thousand Mile Eyes ability, which allowed him to see distant things more clearly and helped him find his way out of the forest. Apart from these newfound abilities, Haruka also obtained presence sense and enemy location, by keeping a watchful eye on his surroundings, even in the absence of any actual monsters. In the morning, Haruka woke up feeling fully alert. He noticed that it was already morning and thankfully, nothing had happened during the night. He credited this to the monster repellent items he possessed and the home protection skill he had acquired. Feeling hungry, he decided to use his fire magic to start a fire. With a pan in hand, he added some mushrooms he had gathered from the forest and threw in some jerky as well. In no time, Haruka's breakfast was ready and he enjoyed a satisfying meal to begin his day. After finishing breakfast, Haruka pondered his plans for the rest of the day. His top priorities were to make the cave his home and ensure he had enough food and safety measures in place. Additionally, he knew he must prepare himself for dealing with potential encounters with monsters in the future. While wandering around, Haruka finally encountered a goblin. The goblin appeared weak, but it was still stronger than Haruka. Seizing the opportunity, Haruka attacked the goblin from behind and managed to take it down. However, his victory was short-lived as he was spotted by another goblin, while dealing with its companion. Undeterred, Haruka knocked out the second goblin as well. Surviving his first battle, Haruka felt relieved and happy. He knew there were many things to reflect on, but he was satisfied with his performance since he made the enemy do most of the movements during the fight, earning him a passing grade. Feeling sudden exhaustion, Haruka made his way back to the cave. After eating some food to replenish his energy, he decided to inspect the club he had taken from the goblins. To his disappointment, he found that the club was too short and heavy for him to use effectively. Despite this setback, there was a silver lining to his day. Haruka's level increased to level 2, bringing him a great deal of happiness and a sense of progress in his journey. Haruka noticed that not only his overall level had increased, but his cane arts and sensitivity skills had also improved. It had been three days since he arrived in the new world, and he was already tired of eating mushrooms every day. He couldn't help but think that the class president would scold him if she were there and he mentioned wanting to eat meat. Haruka felt relieved that he had temporarily solved the issue of hunger, and his level had increased since the previous day. With some time on his hands, he decided to conduct a few tests. His primary focus was on strengthening himself as he dreaded the idea of facing a stronger monster and getting a game over. If possible, he also wanted to make improvements to his home in the cave. While considering all this, he couldn't help but question the purpose of the White Room where he had first arrived. With the many good skills he had acquired, he wondered if it would have been better to skip the White Room altogether and go straight to the other world. Setting out to find meat, Haruka was disappointed to only come across mushrooms again. He then realized that instead of searching for food, he should devote his time to practicing and improving his magic skills. Haruka activated his magic collections and the effects were remarkable. His body felt lighter, almost like he was teleporting, and he experienced a significant improvement in his agility. It was evident that he had become much stronger than the previous day when he effortlessly knocked out a level 11 goblin without breaking a sweat. After taking a well-deserved break, Haruka ventured out again, this time on a goblin hunting spree. During the night, he dedicated his time to researching magic. However, it mostly involved trial and error. After spending five days in the ultimate world, Haruka's progress was evident. He had reached a point where he could defeat a goblin with just one strike, and he had also transformed the interior of his cave, making it more comfortable. Overall, he felt like he was doing well in this new world. One day, while desperately searching for meat, he came across a rabbit and successfully caught it. However, he suddenly sensed the presence of others nearby. Activating his presence sense, he realized that it was his classmates who were also transported to this world. Haruka observed that it was the delinquent brute from his class passing by his location. He didn't want to get involved with them, but he was curious about what they were talking about. Unfortunately, their conversation revolved around objectifying the vice class president's body, which made him feel uncomfortable and pain to listen to. After a while, the group decided to move to another location, much to Haruka's relief. He found their talk so unpleasant that he would have preferred listening to the principal's speech instead. Haruka noticed that the boys in the delinquent group were conspiring against the girls. However, among the girls, there was their class president who always saw through and thwarted the delinquents' plans. She had a reputation for dealing with troublesome individuals since elementary school. It occurred to Haruka that the geeks from his class might finally be flourishing in this fantasy world. They seemed to be well-informed about this kind of environment. Tanako was the one teaching the delinquents about the skills, and it seemed they heavily relied on him despite his possible dislike for it. Haruka couldn't help but feel that everyone else was faring better than him, but he didn't want to bother meeting them, so he decided to return home instead. As he retreated to his cave, he noticed that his loner skill had leveled up. He realized it was probably because he refrained from interacting with his classmates. The thought of his neat level going up despite all the effort he had put in was disheartening, and he found it something worth shedding tears over. Haruka noticed that his main level was still three, mainly due to the skills Jack of All Trades and Wooden Doll. Jack of All Trades prevented him from focusing on one thing and refining it, 
while wooden doll was a completely useless skill. He caught himself talking to himself and realized he couldn't afford to let his loner skill go up again. In an attempt to distract himself, he started binge eating, even if it was only mushrooms. One night, Haruka's presence sense kept activating, compelling him to check who was there even though it was the middle of the night. As he ventured outside, he heard a beeping sound in the distance. Curious, he activated his thousand-mile eyes and saw the geeks from his class engaged in a battle against goblins. He decided to observe them for a while and noticed that their stats seemed pretty decent, suggesting they should be able to handle the goblins. However, to his surprise, the geeks were struggling in their fight against the goblins. Haruka felt compelled to intervene and rush in to attack the goblins, successfully knocking them all out. The grateful geeks thanked Haruka for saving them, but he felt awkward, realizing he hadn't spoken much lately, which was why he had difficulty communicating with them. In an attempt to make small talk and ease the awkwardness, Haruka asked them how everyone else was doing and if they were exploring alone at night. The geeks then tell Haruka that they were attempting to run away, much to his shock. Bringing the group of geeks back to his cave, they were astonished to see how comfortable and well-equipped it was. Haruka offered them some juice that appeared peculiar, leading the geeks to suspect he might be experimenting on them. However, to their surprise, the juice tasted quite good when they tried it. Haruka shared that he made the juice using sweet nuts he found in the forest, mentioning that he had been searching for a bird to have some fried chicken when he discovered them. The geeks mentioned they had searched everywhere but couldn't find anything. Haruka inquired why the boys were running away from their classmates. They proceeded to recount what happened on the day when everyone was teleported into the forest. The initial moments were chaotic, especially with the delinquents and mean girls causing trouble. Amidst the commotion, the class president remained composed while the geeks were busy sharing status information and checking their skills and equipment. Unfortunately, all the chaos attracted a wave of monsters, causing panic. The usually reliable class president froze in fear, and the other girls started crying loudly. Even the delinquents were taken aback when they saw the monsters. In the face of danger, it was the geeks who rose to the occasion, fighting back against the goblins without uttering a word. They were the ones who managed to put an end to the monster's threat. After the chaos with the monsters, a class president who had recovered her composure guided everyone to a safe riverbed. The geeks took the lead by setting up a bonfire and tents, showing that they had been secretly practicing survival skills and were well prepared for such situations. In the following days, as everyone calmed down, discussions began on various aspects of survival. They addressed the distribution of work, rotation of night watch, plans for the future, and the critical issue of food. The class president actively sought advice from the geeks and included their input while putting forth her own thoughts, gradually bringing the class together. Through this process of cooperation and unification, the mood in the class improved significantly, and they started to believe that things would somehow work out. The geeks' preparedness and the class president's leadership played a crucial role in fostering a sense of unity and hope among the classmates. Despite the initial unity and shared feelings among the classmates, problems arose when one girl declared her unwillingness to work with others. She insisted that the boys should take on all the responsibilities. This disagreement sparked a conflict within the class, and the discussion broke down as a result. Upon learning when it happened, Haruka felt immense sympathy for the class president. He was disheartened to know that the geeks had seemingly abandoned her in the beginning. However, the geeks clarified that it wasn't a sudden decision to run away, it was only the start of a much larger story. They explained that eventually even the tasks of collecting food and protecting the base were forced onto the geeks, while some of the other students did not contribute at all. Despite their challenging situation, the geeks continued to proactively fight off monsters, the reason behind their dedication was that they had discovered someone in the group possessed the evil skills of fascination and puppetry, which allowed them to manipulate and control others. As expected, some people in the group started acting differently. The delinquents began leveling up aggressively in the area surrounding the camp and the geeks, who were monitoring them, overheard them discussing their plans to create a harem. Alarmed by the potential danger, the geeks rushed to inform the class president. Upon learning about the threat, the class president resolved to raise her level as well to defend against the delinquent's evil skills. After a few days, the delinquents finally acquired the fascination and puppetry skills. When they encountered the class president, they were immediately taken by her beauty and became excited. However, within seconds, they were all defeated and lying on the ground of slave harem plans utterly crushed. As a result, the delinquents were chased out of the base. Despite their defeat, the delinquents didn't give up and attempted to attack the base again that night, exploiting a break in the defense. The situation became increasingly tense for everyone involved. The attack on the base resulted in significant damage, leaving it completely burned down. Unfortunately, the blame for the incident was unjustly placed on the geeks, even though the class president's group defended them. Despite their defense, the geeks were unfairly expelled from the class, facing the consequences of the unfortunate events that unfolded. Feeling guilty about how he had treated the geeks, Haruka sincerely apologized to them. To lift their spirits, he suggested having a feast that night.
reminding them that they may not be delinquents, but they could still enjoy a good party. On the ninth day in the new world, it was time for the geeks and Haruka to part ways. Before leaving, the geeks asked if Haruka would join them, but he declined. He believed that with his cursed status, he might end up being a burden to them. However, he was intrigued by the idea of visiting the nearby town. After bidding farewell to the geeks, Haruka began to plan his tasks for the day. He decided to head down to the base to inspect the situation there and see what could be done to rebuild and improve it. While making his way to the base, Haruka had an encounter with a kobold. It managed to bite him, causing some discomfort, but he fought it off successfully. Despite the pain, he continued walking until he finally spotted the base. To his dismay, the base appeared in disarray with the fence and tents in pieces, likely due to the absence of the geeks who used to take care of them. Haruka realized there was no one around, making him wonder if they had relocated. As he explored further, he noticed a few footprints and decided to follow them, hoping to find some clues. To his surprise, he encountered the mean girls of his class coming his way, making his situation even more tense. As the girls approached Haruka, he panicked and decided to make a run for it telling them that he had to leave. The girls were left shocked and confused by his sudden reaction and began following him. Hermika thought he would be okay waiting for anyone else, but he felt differently about waiting for the mean girls. Despite trying to escape, he eventually stopped when the mean girls requested him to do so. He was surprised that they were actually asking him, someone they usually treated poorly, to wait for them. The situation left him surprised and unsure of their intentions. They told him that they knew Haruka was on good terms with the geeks, and they had been looking for them all over. As the mean girls approached Haruka, they asked him to tell them where to find the geeks. Haruka was surprised because he thought they just wanted to force the geeks to work again. But the mean girls surprised him by saying they wanted to apologize. They realized their past behavior was wrong, and they knew the geeks had helped them survive in this new world. They genuinely wanted to say sorry and thank them. Haruka was shocked to see the mean girls bowing and asking for his help. He never thought something like this could happen in the real world. Haruka didn't want to burden the geeks, who had already been chased out by everyone, so he decided to test the mean girls a bit. He warned them that they wouldn't be able to catch up to the geeks at their current pace. The girls were okay with that. They just wanted to know where the geeks were going. Haruka then asked them if they knew how to leave the forest or if they could fight the monsters. The girls seemed uncertain. Frustrated, Haruka lashed out at them, saying he didn't care if they had terrible personalities or if they had reformed themselves. They needed to decide if they truly wanted to apologize or if they were just going to give up. The girls began crying, expressing that they didn't want to die and that all they wanted was a chance to apologize properly to the geeks. They pleaded with Haruka to teach them how to survive, so they could atone for their mistakes and repay their debt to the geeks. Accidentally, Haruka agreed to help the mean girls. He realized that he had some sort of control over them, causing them to follow him obediently. They looked lifeless, following his every move and awaiting his orders. Haruka would weaken the enemies and the girls would silently finish them off, handing him the magic stones afterwards. As this peculiar alliance continued, the class president eventually found Haruka. Haruka seemed to be deep in some thought and it appeared that he was not acknowledging the class president's existence. Meanwhile, he pondered why the mean girls had become subservient to him and how to break this strange control over them. Despite the class president's attempts to get his attention, Haruka remained lost in his thoughts. When the class president shouted at Haruka, he snapped back to reality. The mean girls were overjoyed to see her. She asked Haruka why he had the girls with him in the forest, and he explained the whole story, causing the class president to get upset with him. She questioned why he used a skill meant for monsters on humans. Haruka assured her it happened unintentionally and that the girls were listed as bitches in his status screen. This made the girls look at him with cold eyes. As he tried to leave, the girls stopped him. Shibazaki, one of the mean girls, mentioned that she felt fine as the effect of the subjugation had worn off. The class president was relieved and asked everyone to gather for a talk. Feeling left out, Haruka realized that being alone was his usual state. To pass the time, he practiced the expansion magic he used to make his house bigger. However, it backfired and he ended up stuck in the ground. The class president scolded Haruka for not sitting still as she had instructed. She compared him to a cat stuck behind a sofa. The class president revealed that she had heard most of the story from Shimazaki and acknowledged that the girls had been a great help to everyone. With gratitude, the girls, including the class president, thanked Haruka for all he had done for them. Feeling awkward, Haruka wanted to leave, but the class president asked him where he wanted to go. He mentioned that he wanted to return to his house. The girls were surprised as they didn't know he had a house. As they whispered among themselves, the class president inquired about the capacity of his house. Haruka said it could fit about 240 people, and with some furniture removed, even more could squeeze in. She seemed envious of his lavish lifestyle, but with tears in her eyes, she requested that they stay at his house for one night. Haruka was excited about having the girls over at his house, but he made a comment about how shameless girls are these days. The class president became defensive and told him that he was the one being shameless. Despite the initial banter, the girls happily followed Haruka to his house. After a long walk, they arrived at his lavish home and the girls were amazed. They exclaimed that his house looked like a different world and couldn't believe something so grand was in the middle of the forest. Haruka found their reactions more dramatic than even the geeks, and it made him feel a bit embarrassed. 
When Haruka informed the girls about the kitchen and the bathroom, they rushed towards the bathroom while undressing, leaving Haruka in shock. Only the class president remained by his side and didn't undress. Haruka realized that the time spent in the forest had turned the girls into pure savages. They expressed their delight in the bath and the healthy mushroom meals. Despite their excitement, Haruka felt a sense of relief and independence as he settled into his magic tent outside. He was happy to finally be alone, something only a loner could truly understand. After all, he knew he couldn't have survived being in the same room with a bunch of high school girls for an extended period of time. After being startled by the sudden appearance of the class president, Haruka learns that all the other guys left the camp after the geeks departed, and she wanted to express her gratitude to him. The class president feels down because she believes she couldn't do much to help compared to the geeks. Haruka reassures her that she had been looking after and protecting all of her classmates, which was indeed a significant contribution. However, the class president still feels inadequate, especially compared to the geeks who were exceptional in their own way. Haruka comforts her, saying there's no need to compare herself to those who have unique talents for surviving in this world. He believes it's more concerning how everyone else is preparing for future summonings to other worlds. The class president feels a bit better after talking with Haruka and wonders if he is even weirder than the geeks, having a house that eats real meals and defeats monsters. Haruka teases her that her remark was cutting deep. She then goes back inside to peacefully sleep with the rest of the girls. The next morning, Haruka was woken up by a girl he had never seen before. She informed him that breakfast was ready and urged him to get up soon. He was taken aback by her presence as he had never encountered her before. Haruka realizes that the girl is actually someone from his class. He tells her that he'll get up in 30 minutes. However, she gets uncomfortably close to him and questions why he doesn't plan on getting up soon. This flusters Haruka, and he quickly asks her about the breakfast. The girl reveals that she made grilled fish and mushrooms. Haruka is both shocked and delighted as he loves the taste of fish and hasn't had it in a long time. The class president asks him why he didn't catch fish from the nearby river since he's been living right in front of it all this time. She wonders why he didn't take the opportunity to catch and cook fish for himself. Haruka admits that he did watch the fish while eating his mushrooms. The class president questions why he didn't just catch them then. Haruka explains that the fish are fast and slippery, making them difficult to catch. He then asks the girls if there's any easy way to catch the fish. One of the girls volunteers to show Haruka an easy way to catch fish. She uses her lightning magic to attack the fish, forcing them to come out of the water. Haruka asks her to demonstrate it again, and she does. Then she lets Haruka borrow the orb of lightning magic, and he uses the packaging skill on it. With this technique, he successfully catches a fish and feels thrilled about it. Haruka successfully learned lightning magic as a bonus. The class president questioned what he had done, and Haruka told her that he was studying lightning magic. By using the packaging skill, he could surround any spell and learn the corresponding magic. The class president thought it was akin to cheating. Haruka clarified that it was a result of combining packaging with jack-of-all-trades, but his level wouldn't go up with just that. Later, Haruka inquires about the girl's plans moving forward. He suggests that they stay in his cave while he makes some renovations. The class president explains that the girls haven't reached a consensus yet, but most of them want to go to the town. Even the mean girls want to apologize to the geeks. The class president also mentions that they've been discussing ways to raise their levels. Haruka offers his help to the girls if they want to level up. Before Haruka begins their training, he asks the girls about their levels. He is shocked to learn that their levels are much higher than his. The lowest level among them is 16 while Haruka is still at level 7. Despite this, he tells the girls to try defeating a bunch of kobolds. The girls believe that Haruka is underestimating them, but when they face the kobolds, they are overpowered and defeated. Haruka gets annoyed because he finds the girls utterly useless. The girls started complaining that they didn't know the kobolds could bite and be so fast. They were all inside Haruka's tent, having a post-fight review session. After a while, the review was finally over and the girls started to head back. Haruka realized that as a loner, it was tough to sit through it. Nevertheless, he felt that it was worth it as the girls seemed motivated after the review. After all the girls left, the girl who made fish for Haruka earlier approached him. She expressed that the boys who attacked them last time had made all of them feel on edge, thinking that Haruka might do the same. However, she noticed that Haruka was different. He provided them with food, shelter, and even taught them how to fight. She then promised to come and get him again tomorrow once they cooked the fish. The next morning, while Haruka was enjoying his breakfast, the girl excitedly announced that they were going to get revenge on the kobolds. Haruka interrupted and asked how they could come up with that plan after being utterly defeated yesterday. He didn't want to end up carrying them back again. Thankfully, the class president intervened and suggested that they should train first. Haruka felt relieved at her suggestion. The group began their training by fighting goblins and eventually the day of revenge against the kobolds arrived. Haruka was concerned about whether the girls would be able to handle it properly as they looked extremely exhausted while fighting. Some of them even pretended to be sick or fell asleep during the battle. 
However, the rest of the girls managed to defeat the kobolds and get their revenge. Haruka felt relieved that they made it through. After that, it was time for them to continue their journey through the forest and make their way towards the town. Later, the class president checks with the girls if they have enough fish and mushrooms for their journey. She notices Haruka instructing one of the girls to fit more in her bag. As the girls prepare to leave for the town, Haruka pulls the class president aside and expresses his uncertainty about what might happen after they leave. He advises her to brace herself for whatever challenges or adventures may lie ahead in the future. In another part of the forest, a terrified student pleaded with a menacing figure not to kill kill him, stating that he didn't possess the skill the person was seeking. Despite the student's pleas, the figure choked him until he lost consciousness and then left him lying there. Haruka and the girls found themselves deep in the forest, prioritizing their safety above all else. They knew the delinquents might still be after them, so their main goal was to find a way to escape the forest. As the group ventured through the forest, the geeks mentioned the existence of a powerful monster that even Haruka had not encountered yet, the dreaded orc. Determined to gain valuable experience, Haruka decided to face the orc on his own. He instructed the girls to step back and observe closely, using the fight as a reference for future encounters. Counters. Haruka then disappeared from sight before launching his attack on the orc. Amused by its sluggish movements, the geeks had advised him to use focused magic against the orc, as they were resistant to physical damage. However, the orc soon managed to locate Haruka and swung its club at him. Haruka skillfully evaded the attacks and swiftly struck the orc from behind, causing it to lose consciousness. The girls complained that this wouldn't be helpful as a reference. Haruka chuckled and revealed that the information about the orcs was provided by the geeks. Sensing another orc nearby, Haruka decided to test his magic attack on it. With a spell courtesy of the geeks, he unleashed his flame magic and the orc was instantly defeated. Haruka found it puzzling that the orc was defeated so quickly, as even with the magic attack, it should have taken some time. The girls didn't seem impressed with his performance, as the sun had already set. Haruka proposed setting up a camp for the night with the girls. They arranged the tents and Haruka used his magic to dig a hole in the ground as a precaution against any potential enemies. The tents were equipped with magic repellents and Haruka's presence sense skill would also be useful in keeping them safe. Finally, he activated his map to check the route they were going to take tomorrow. Haruka observed the river they were planning to follow, noting how it zigzagged after a certain distance, making it a good marker to prevent getting lost. Suddenly, he sensed the presence of humans nearby, and to his dismay, he thought them to be delinquents. Haruka knew it would be challenging to protect everyone in this situation. However, as the group closed in, it turned out that they were not the delinquents but the athlete group of Haruka's class. The class president noticed Haruka talking to the athlete group from afar. Haruka playfully teased the boys, asking if they were there to secretly follow the girls around late at night. The boys laughed and told him he had it all wrong. It seemed like they were enjoying the banter with Haruka, who was just having some fun with them. The athlete boys clarified to Haruka that they were there to meet him, not the girls. When Haruka jokingly suggested that they might be gay, they quickly denied it and explained that it wasn't the case. Haruka then asked why they were hiding from the girls and the boys shared their reasons. They said they couldn't fully trust the girls after a particular incident, which led to their hesitation and doubts about them. Haruka inquired if they were referring to the discovery of the skill's puppetry and fascination. The boys remained silent and Haruka questioned why they were more wary of the girls than the delinquents. The boys explained that you should understand their perspective. Haruka believed that what the athletes feared and the skill the geeks considered most dangerous was plunder. It was a skill that could steal the abilities of others, making it incredibly powerful and ruthless perhaps the strongest among all the rare skills. The boys confirmed that their fear was indeed centered around plunder. They noticed that the delinquents were making a fuss over puppetry and fascination, but no one mentioned plunder, which implied that those particular skills were possessed by someone else. Haruka playfully frightened the boys by asking what they would do if he had the plunder skill. The boys responded that it would be a tremendous relief if Haruka had that skill. Haruka reassured the boys that he didn't possess the plunder skill, and instead had the subjugation skill. They had come to warn him about the danger of plunder and want him to stay safe. The boys then returned to the forest, remaining cautious of the delinquents. Before they left, Haruka jokingly advised them to try talking things out with the goblins, believing that idiots will get along with other idiots just fine. The boys asked Haruka to apologize to the class president on their behalf before leaving. The next day, Haruka gathered the girls and informed them, that they would be venturing deeper into the forest. The girls were excited and filled with energy. Haruka had been using his inspection skill to search for food other than mushrooms, but had only found numerous antidote herbs instead. As he was doing this, the class president approached him to discuss something. She asked if he had met with the athlete group from their class. Haruka then remembered that they wanted to apologize to her. 
The class president then revealed to Haruka that she was the one with the plunderer skill. Haruka appeared to already know about it, which shocked the class president. Haruka candidly told the class president that it was quite evident she possessed the plunder skill. She asked him why he still chose to help her despite knowing this and whether he was afraid of her. Haruka replied that just like the geeks, he wasn't afraid of her either. The class president felt relieved by his response and expressed her gratitude to Haruka for everything he had done for them. Haruka noticed that they had been making good progress on their journey, but it was time to set up camp. He suggested looking for a location near a floor flowing river and away from any potential monster threats. Haruka then asked the class president if it was alright for him to go and gather some information since the forest appeared to be relatively safe. She agreed as long as it wasn't a dangerous task he was undertaking. After the class president told Haruka to stay put, he activated his magic collection and applied weight magic to his body, making himself extremely light. With this newfound ability, he found it easy to climb up trees and realized he could jump high into the sky with a running start. Haruka attempted to fly and was amazed at his momentary success, but he quickly fell back down. He realized that without strengthening his body using magic collection, he would have died instantly. Nonetheless, he was glad to have gained something from the experience. From his elevated position, he could see everything more clearly. Seeing Haruka in that state, the class president became worried. He explained that he had attempted to fly to get a better view of the terrain from above, but ended up falling down. Despite that, he brought more fruit for the juice, which excited everyone. The next day, their journey out of the forest was much quicker, thanks to Haruka's reconnaissance. They had faced many challenges during their trip, but finally, they were rewarded with success, as they found themselves out of the massive forest. Upon exiting the forest, Haruka decides to explore the area a bit further and discovers his ability to move while walking midair. The class president asks him to check the safety of the area using his thousand-mile eyes power. As he activates the skill and zooms in, Haruka sees a group of six people being attacked by a monster. The class president inquires whether they can handle the situation on their own or if they are winning. Haruka comes to the realization that in such a world, it's expected for humans to be attacked by monsters, and there's no guarantee that those people in distress are necessarily good-hearted individuals. Helping them out of goodwill may backfire if they turn out to be thieves or hostile. This is a major risk as he had experienced with the delinquents. He believes the girls are too naive in their approach. Haruka's main reason for accompanying them to town is that he believes humans can be scarier than monsters. However, the class president insists on going to save the people under attack by the monsters. She asks the fastest girls to get ready, but Haruka doubts they will reach in time. He questions the class president's plan if those people turn out to be thieves. She replies that if they are hostile and attack them, she will fight back. Haruka wasn't surprised by the class president's determination to help the people under attack. He informed her that he would be right back and urged the girls to take care of themselves. Using his magic, Haruka prepared to go and aid the people, but he knew he wouldn't make it in time if he ran. So he strengthened his body with magic collection, made himself weightless with weight magic, and used the wind magic he had learned earlier to fly. As he soared through the air, he suddenly felt something on his back and to his astonishment, it was the class president. She confessed that she didn't know how she got caught up in all of this. With a loud crash, Haruka and the class president landed on top of the monsters, swiftly defeating them all. The group of people that Haruka had just rescued expressed their gratitude and thanked him for saving them. Among them, their leader, Ofter, and another guy named Gatek, inquired if Haruka was headed to the town of Omu. They offered to treat him to anything as a token of their appreciation. Haruka jokingly asked if they could provide him with some girls as a gift, which made both Ofter and Gatek chuckle. They suggested continuing their conversation in town. Later, Ofter informed Haruka that packs of green wolves had been targeting merchants recently, prompting the guild to issue a request for help. They were initially told that the number of wolves wouldn't be too high, but they ended up encountering over 30 of them. It would have been disastrous if Haruka hadn't intervened. Haruka mentioned that a large green wolf had fled early on, causing their party to suffer significant losses. Afterward, they decided to divide the remaining cargo and return home. With nothing else to do until the rest of the girls arrived, Haruka decided to pass the time by consuming some strength mushrooms. He used his fire magic to grill them for a meal to hand them out to the party. Even without some major damage, they must have some minor damage or fatigue. They felt better and seemed to enjoy the mushrooms a lot. After rejoining with the rest of the group, everyone was immediately captivated by the elf women, acting like crazed fangirls. With the party guiding them, they set off toward the town of Omi. Despite Haruka's warning, the girls decided to race to the town. Finally, they arrived at the town and the girls were happy to have made it there. The delinquents, lit by Katsuyama, had significantly raised their levels and were now prepared to seek out the girls to attack them. One of the boys suggests that before attacking the girls, they should unseal fascination and puppetry. The group agrees to locate the geeks first and ensure they don't escape when they find them. Upon entering the lively town of Omi, the girls couldn't contain their excitement and enthusiasm to explore. The class president reminded them to stay together and not wander too far apart. Haruka felt relieved that everyone had arrived safely in the town, realizing that his role was finally over. The class president sought Haruka's help to gather and control the girls, but he was sitting in a corner, seemingly relaxed. 
Undeterred, the class president took charge and called the girls together, just as she would in class, and it worked. She then shared her plan with the group. Ofter would introduce them to the Adventurers Guild, where they would cash in their loot, register as adventurers, and find an inn. Additionally, she wanted to inquire about the geeks. Haruka observed that Ofter and Getek were tense, likely due to their near-death encounter with the Green Wolves. As they delved deeper into the town, the atmosphere turned unsettling until they finally reached the Adventurers Guild. Inside, the group was met with cold stares from other adventurers. Some of them tried to provoke Haruka, but he quickly scared them off, making them bow down before him. The class president intervened and instructed Haruka to sit quietly in a corner. Afterwards, Ofter led the group to the second floor and introduced Haruka to the guild master, an elderly man. Haruka, however, was tired of dealing with older men and wished to meet girls instead. Initially, the guild master appeared intimidating and Haruka could sense a tremendous amount of pressure. He braced himself, expecting to be scolded, but to his surprise, the guild master's intentions were entirely different. Instead of reprimanding him, the guild master wanted to express his gratitude towards Haruka for assisting Ofter and others. Haruka was taken aback by the unexpected turn of events. Following that, Ofter made an announcement that their next task involved exchanging goods and afterward, they were required to register with the guild. Haruka disclosed his intention to sell some magic stones and suggested that the rest of the group proceed with the registration process while he was away. Haruka had gathered lots of magic stones by defeating goblins and with help from the hardworking girls cleaning up after him. He felt excited about selling them and possibly becoming wealthy in that world. When he showed the exchange window lady his collection, she was shocked by the amount and said she couldn't appraise all of them at once. Haruka then revealed he had even more magic stones and she asked him to come back the next day. After the girls finished registering with the guild, Ofter and Gatek discussed the impressive high levels of the entire group, with everyone being above level 30. The guild was abuzz with excitement as 20 cheat users registered all at once. Only Haruka remained to complete his registration. When Haruka finally got himself registered, he believed that this marked the end of his NEET lifestyle. The class president expressed confidence in Haruka, stating that he would become a great adventurer, far surpassing the girls who were considered nothing special compared to him. However, Haruka's life took an unexpected turn when he learned that his level was lower than 10. The lady at the guild explained to Haruka that he could only become a full-fledged adventurer after reaching level 10. At the beginning, he needed to train with the party, then become a trainee at level 20, and finally gain the ability ability to operate independently at level 30. Haruka's level was incredibly low, preventing him from becoming an adventurer. Moreover, his loner skill made it impossible for him to join a party, leaving him with no choice but to reach level 30 before he could register. Feeling disappointed, he couldn't help but conclude that he was still a NEET at heart. The class president empathized with Haruka's situation and decided that while he took the time to recover and improve, the rest of the group would proceed to an inn. The group follows the guild's suggestion and heads to the hotel. To Haruka's surprise, it turns out to be no ordinary hotel but a love motel alley. They are greeted by the poster girl, who was already informed by the guild about their arrival. The group is then divided into different rooms to rest. As Haruka enters his room, he finds it to be normal and unremarkable. Despite having hopes of earning money by exchanging his magic stones, he tries to keep his expectations low, considering that the stones were of relatively low quality. On the following day, the class president shared with everyone that the receptionist informed them about the town of Onmui being relatively safe and well-equipped with most of the basic necessities, making it suitable for an extended stay. However, Haruka couldn't help feeling sad about the town lacking a bookstore, a feeling only a true geek like him could understand. Hearing the word geek, the poster girl inquires if Haruka is referring to people dressed similarly to him. The class president then asks her if she has seen a group of four boys, to which she replies that they are frequent visitors to the town. The mean girls were relieved to hear that the geeks were safe. Initially planning to leave, Haruka changed his mind and decided to stay in order to meet the geeks. Later, when he went to the exchange window to collect his money from selling the magic stones, the staff handed him some money but apologized, stating that they only had this much ready. Confused, Haruka expressed that he wasn't trying to rob them and asked for an explanation. The guildmaster, also present at the scene, apologized to Haruka and explained that they were still processing the large quantity of magic stones which caused the delay. To make matters worse, they didn't even have enough money to pay him for the portion that had been processed so far. The guildmaster then requested Haruka to accept the money from them in installments. Afterward, Haruka received 8 million air from the exchange window. With this amount of money, he believed they could live comfortably for a while. Meanwhile, Gatek, who had been standing nearby, reminded Haruka of the time he promised to do anything to show his gratitude. Haruka felt thrilled at the prospect knowing that Gatek would take him to a place filled with girls. Gatek led Haruka to a weapon shop, which left him disappointed as he was expecting something else. Gatek explained that the shop specializes in selling exceptional products from unique dungeons and caters to people who are not considered normal, just like Haruka. Feeling offended, Haruka took the remark personally. However, Gatek reassured him that despite the shop's peculiar appearance, 
He can vouch for the high quality products they offer. The shopkeeper may seem a bit eccentric, but he is genuinely a good guy. Curious and intrigued, Haruka decided to browse the various products in the shop. He first tried on a magic reflection cloak, even though he hadn't encountered any magic attacks yet. However, he saw its potential as a valuable trump card for future situations. He then experimented with a power glove, finding it fascinating too. Impressed by the items, Haruka ended up trying out several other things and ultimately purchased them. Among the products, the necklace of Take 7 caught his attention, and he asked the owner about it. The owner explained that with this necklace, Haruka could store the effects of seven other items, allowing him to use them later when needed. Excited by the possibilities, Haruka believed he could combine different items with the equipment he was wearing at the time, making him even more powerful. His curiosity peaked. He also decided to buy the rope of mistletoe, even though its explanation seemed lacking. He learned that it could strengthen his staff, and that was enough reason for him to make the purchase. As Haruka was engrossed in exploring the shop's intriguing items, a class president showed up and scolded him for taking too much time. Haruka expressed his desire to spend more time there, but in his excitement, he accidentally combined some of the items without completing the purchase process. This mistake angered the owner, who chastised Haruka for combining the items before paying for them. The owner then informed him of the total amount he was supposed to pay, but it turned out to be more than Haruka had anticipated. Having spent all this money on the items from the shop, Haruka found himself in a state of depression the next day. He was broke and unable to buy anything anymore. The class president refused to give him any allowance and he couldn't take any guild requests to earn money. Furthermore, whenever he attempted to leave town for errands, the class president stopped him, insisting on knowing his exact intentions. Feeling trapped, Haruka made up his mind to break out. Haruka's initial attempt to break out was by asking the class president politely, but she instantly refused his request. Despite his sincere desire to go out and make money, she remained at Damon and wouldn't allow him to leave under any circumstances. Haruka worried that he might end up with the poor title due to his current financial situation. Determined to find a way out, he remembered the magic cloak he had purchased earlier, which could obscure the wearer's figure. With that idea in mind, he decided to use the cloak's effect to sneak out of town and then sneak back in later. Hoping to go unnoticed by the class president, he mustered the courage to give it a try and escape. As Haruka activated the power of the cloak, an unusual sensation filled the air, causing the class president to sneeze as he swiftly passed by her. However, his attempt to cross the outer wall didn't go as planned, and he ended up falling down. The class president caught up to him and inquired about his destination, interrupting his escape. Meanwhile, another girl from their group was also present, trying on different clothes in a rather exhibitionist manner. After the class president's departure, Haruka sensed the presence of this girl. Later, he overheard the girls engaged in conversations about clothes among themselves, which made him realize that they were gradually adapting to their new life in the town. Later, the main girls go out to hang out and Shimazaki notices the geeks there. As Shimazaki informed the girls about the geek, they turned around to see if they could spot them. But to their surprise, there was no one there. It seemed that Shimazaki had made a mistake in her observation. Later, the girls prepared themselves for their first quest, which made Haruka feel jealous. He also wanted to go out and do something, but the class president was adamant about not allowing him. Eventually, she relented when he said he wanted to check on the geek's well-being. However, she warned him to be careful not to get caught by the gatekeeper. Haruka then readied himself to search for the geeks. He put on his cloak and passed by the gatekeeper who couldn't notice him. Soon enough, Haruka came across a strange village and decided not to go there since there was no geek or athletic group. He then came across a bunch of goblins and decided not to engage in a fight with them. Afterwards, Haruka stumbled upon a gang of bad people attacking a carriage. He still chose not to get involved with that whole situation. As he was about to leave, one of the bad people stopped him and asked where he was going. The thugs aimed to kill Haruka, who happened to be the witness. Frustrated by the sudden turn of events after leaving the city, Haruka employed his fire magic, setting the thugs ablaze in self-defense. Haruka realized that the fire staff he purchased from the shop earlier was very effective and powerful. The thugs became irritated with Haruka and his strength, but they refused to give up and attacked him once more. Nevertheless, Haruka defeated them once again. The thugs underestimated Haruka's power since he was only at level 9. However, they eventually grew exhausted and collapsed as they couldn't overpower him. Just then, a girl named Muriel, who was a noble, came out of the carriage to thank Haruka. Haruka thought she was not very useful and didn't react. When Mariel came closer and started screaming to get his attention, only then did Haruka acknowledge her. Meanwhile, the athletic group faced the delinquents. As they started fighting, something pierced through the chest of the delinquents' leader. The girls had finally settled down in the city and began earning a living, but a dreadful danger was slowly approaching from the forest. Haruka understood that it was the moment to put to good use all the new equipment he had purchased earlier. 
We return to Mariel and Haruka. Mariel explains to Haruka that while she was on her way home from a business meeting, the thugs suddenly attacked her. She shares how worried she was about the situation had Haruka not been there to help. Mariel's guards inform her that the thugs' swords were coated with poison and they were feeling unwell. Fortunately, Haruka remembered that he had some herbs with him and he had prepared an antidote from those herbs. He gave the guards the antidote, assuring them that they would be alright. Mariel was immensely grateful to Haruka for not only rescuing her, but also seeing her guards with his antidote. Haruka felt relieved that the antidote herbs came in handy. Mariel then requested Haruka to accompany them back to her town, expressing her desire to properly show her gratitude. Haruka agreed, but he also mentioned that her town should be nearby, as he needed to reach his own town before nightfall. As they began their journey, Haruka inquired about the name of Mariel's town. She replied that it was a city located upstream of the river. Haruka found the name quite peculiar and unusual. It turned out that the name of her town was actually Shitty Town. This revelation made Mariel emotional as she referred to herself as a shitty daughter of a shitty lord. Upon arriving at Mariel's mansion, Haruka was amazed by its grand size. As he made an attempt to leave, Mariel insisted that he wait for her inside as she needed to change her clothes. Haruka tried to defend himself by explaining that he had initially chosen to wait outside. Later, Haruka and Mariel shared a dinner together, and Haruka was astonished by the wide array of foods prepared in his honor. Mariel disclosed that she wanted to express her gratitude by inviting him to this meal, but Haruka couldn't resist devouring everything which annoyed Mariel. After the dinner, Haruka received his reward, which turned out to be an ID card with the name Onwi engraved on it. Mariel explained that this card would grant him unrestricted access to enter and leave the city, and it would also change his status. However, Haruka got distracted by the dessert he was about to eat and wasn't paying much attention to Muriel's explanation. Muriel felt disappointed because she had even dressed up in a dress for Haruka. Later, when Haruka returned to the inn and examined the ID card, he became extremely delighted. Now he had the freedom to enter and leave the city of Onwi as he pleased. With the ID card in hand, Haruka came to the realization that not even the class president and the gatekeeper could prevent him from coming and going as he pleased. He knew he had to change his approach. His desire was to find the geeks and then return to his cave since it was the only perfect home for him. As Haruka traveled back into the forest, he observed that everything remained unchanged. Abundant mushrooms dotted the landscape, fish swam in the waters, and numerous kobolds and goblins still roamed the area. Suddenly, an orc attempted to ambush Haruka from behind, but he swiftly dispatched the threat. Haruka found it strange to encounter an orc there, as they were usually deeper in the forest. Nevertheless, with his new equipment, dealing with enemies had become too easy for him. However, he couldn't shake off a feeling of unease. He realized that only four days had passed since he left the forest, and he wondered if something had happened while he was away. His sensibility skill picked up on something amiss. Upon finding blood on the ground, he considered the geeks and the athletic club members. He dismissed the geeks, knowing they were specialists and unlikely to be involved in any accidents. He pondered whether the athletic club members might have had a confrontation with the delinquents. As he ventured deeper, his shock grew and he discovered the athletes lying injured on the ground. Harunka was taken aback by the sorry state of the athletes and couldn't understand what had transpired. He promptly administered his potions to them and they gradually regained consciousness. They disclosed to Haruka that they were unexpectedly ambushed by the delinquents. Haruka inquired if the geeks had also been attacked, but the athletes clarified that the delinquents had solely focused on them. The athletes shared that the delinquents were surprisingly strong, and they stood no chance against them. The athletes now understood what the delinquents were after. Their target was the class president as they sought to obtain her plunder skill. However, the athletes were unaware of the class president's whereabouts. When they were on the brink of death, the delinquents offered to spare them if they revealed the class president's location. That's why they sought refuge in Haruka's cave, fearing that the delinquents would follow their bloodstains to find them. The athletes believed that with Haruka's assistance, they could defeat the delinquents. However, Haruka made it clear that he would confront the delinquents alone. The athletes were astonished because they were confident that Haruka wouldn't stand a chance against the delinquents on his own. Despite their concern, Haruka insisted that their task now was to return to the city and apologize to the class president for their foolish actions. The group agreed to follow Haruka's instructions, and they set off for the city. Haruka understood that having the athletes by his side would undoubtedly be a significant advantage, but he was determined to face the delinquents alone. However, he also recognized that in his current state, he wouldn't be able to defeat them. He realized the urgent need to become stronger as quickly as possible. To counter this, Haruka wrapped his fire staff with magic and combined multiple skills. With a powerful strike, Haruka defeated the Goblin King in one blow. Haruka realized that by combining his weak skills, he could make them useful. But just as he was celebrating, a level 50 Goblin Emperor appeared suddenly. Haruka knew he couldn't run away or defeat the powerful Goblin Emperor in a regular fight. Haruka decided to try the same strategy he used against the Goblin King. He knew he had to use all of his magic power and take a big risk, 
Suddenly, he obtained a new skill called Truth and Why. Haruka's new skill emerged from combining all his skills. He attempted to defeat the Goblin Emperor with a single powerful blow but failed. The Goblin Emperor was too fast. Haruka knew he couldn't escape from the Goblin Emperor's weapon skill. He attacked again, and though the Goblin Emperor recovered quickly, Haruka managed to deal more damage than before. Haruka understood the seriousness of the situation but remained determined to fight. After a tough fight, Haruka won and defeated the Goblin Emperor. Checking his stats, he discovered new skills. Still feeling less powerful than that guy, Haruka wanted the cheat skill from him. Suddenly, Tanaka, the geek leader, emerged from the shadows. The athletes finally arrived in the city of Omu and found the girls there. The girls were shocked to see them in such a state. They told the girls that Haruka was still fighting in the forest. Meanwhile, Tanaka disclosed to Haruka that he had made the athletes guide him to the class president's location. He had even come to Haruka's hideout. However, Haruka informed him that he had already sent the athletes to the city to inform the girls about everything. Tanaka revealed that he had killed the delinquents by taking them by surprise, and he was one step away from realizing his plan. Haruka's suspicions about the delinquents were correct. It was revealed that everything had been orchestrated by Tanaka from the beginning. He confessed to manipulating the delinquents and breaking the unity of the class. Haruka questioned Tanaka about the other geeks, and Tanaka admitted that he had killed all of them, including the delinquents, totaling 12 people. Tanaka then declared that the conversation was over, as he needed to go get the class president. He belittled Haruka, calling him a small fry with leftover skills. This infuriated Haruka, and he vowed not to let Tanaka reach the class president before him, as he could promise her that he would return. Haruka pointed his fire staff at Tanaka, and he could tell that Tanaka was annoyed and prepared to fight. Haruka noticed that Tanaka possessed a considerable amount of magic power. As Tanaka launched his attacks, Haruka narrowly managed to dodge them one after another. Tanaka expressed surprise, acknowledging that he had underestimated Haruka, as he was not as weak as he initially thought. Curious, Tanaka inquired how long Haruka had been suspicious of him. Haruka revealed that he had been suspicious of Tanaka from the very beginning. Knowing Tanaka's background as a math nerd, Haruka found it odd that he would associate with the delinquents, suspecting that he must have had ulterior motives for doing so. Haruka inquired when Tanaka had started planning all of this, and Tanaka admitted that he had conceived the plan right from the beginning. His idea took shape when he came across the meddling skill, which could manipulate a target's movements to some extent. Seeing this skill, he wondered how he could exploit it to break the unity of the class. Tanaka then restrained Haruka and launched an attack, but to his surprise, Haruka absorbed his magic. Haruka was relieved that the mistletoe ivy he had compounded at the weapon store seemed to have an unknown effect, although he hadn't tested it before. Recognizing the need to act swiftly, Haruka aimed to strike before Tanaka could utilize his weapon skill. He knew he couldn't miss this chance as Tanaka appeared to be in shock. Tanaka managed to block Haruka's strike, and he had only pretended to be surprised. He disclosed his intention to break Haruka's spirits, revealing the array of weapons he planned to use to accomplish it. Haruka realized that Tanaka's attack patterns were too diverse, making it impossible to defend against all of them. As Haruka took a critical hit from Tanaka, he asked if his spirit was broken yet. Haruka realized that the situation was even worse than he had expected. Tanaka ruthlessly attacked Haruka, and he struggled to evade all of the strikes. Haruka was surprised to see that Tanaka's weapon skill was even faster and stronger than he had anticipated. Tanaka used various skills against him. Haruka eventually figured out Tanaka's skill, which turned out to be the copycat skill. This ability allowed Tanaka to copy and use any skill, just like the original. Haruka realized that all of the moves Tanaka executed were a result of copying the skills of the 12 people he had killed. Tanaka kept relentlessly attacking Haruka without giving him any chance to rest. Haruka appeared to be completely overwhelmed. However, it turned out that Haruka was just pretending to be defeated. He accidentally dodged one of Tanaka's attacks, revealing that he had seen through Tanaka's copycat skill. Haruka noticed that Tanaka never used the same skill repeatedly on him, which helped him figure it out. Tanaka panicked because he was worried about exhausting all the limits of his copied skills. Haruka realized that he still had a chance to win the fight. Haruka had even gotten used to Tanaka's speed and was able to land a hit on him. Now it was Haruka's turn to attack Tanaka, but Tanaka resisted fiercely and continued to launch powerful attacks. Despite the resistance, Tanaka was impressed by Haruka's skills, but he couldn't understand why he was losing to someone like Haruka. Tanaka then revealed that he had no other option but to use his ultimate trump card. He activates his ultimate cheat skill, and Haruka didn't find it any different from his other skills. Unexpectedly, the ground beneath them started to crumble, and Haruka believed that breaking the ground might be Tanaka's trump card. However, it turned out that Tanaka had attacked Haruka from behind, using his instant death skill. As a result, Haruka fell unconscious to the ground. Tanaka celebrated his victory, claiming that Haruka had forced him to use his ultimate trump card earlier than he intended. He had planned to save that skill for later, but Haruka's strength made him use it during their fight. Tanaka stated that once he obtained the plunder skill, 
He could use his ultimate cheat skill as much as he pleased. As he prepared to leave, Haruka suddenly stood up and asked Tanaka where he thought he was going. Tanaka was astonished to see Haruka alive and standing. Haruka disclosed that he possessed the healthy skill, which made Tanaka's skill less effective against him. He also mentioned that his luck had surpassed its limits. When he fell to the ground earlier, he was actually playing along with the act. When Tanaka inquired how Haruka could move despite him using the meddling skill, Haruka revealed his secret. He explained that he had been using the good-for-nothing skill when facing opponents who could control his body. Even when he was hit by the meddling skill, which disrupted his nerves, he could use the good-for-nothing skill to regain control over his body. Tanaka became furious and launched his lethal skill at Haruka. However, to Tanaka's dismay, the skill had no effect on Haruka who calmly told him that he had just wasted his skill on him. We are taken back to Tanaka's past when he found his everyday school routine incredibly boring. The class seemed dull to him because he was exceptionally intelligent and he despised being surrounded by low-intelligence people. He often wished for his school life to end soon. Then, unexpectedly, a bright light engulfed the entire class, transporting him to a fantasy world. Tanaka couldn't contain his excitement when something suddenly appeared before him, the skill board. He became elated, realizing that if he used it wisely, he would never be bored again. He meticulously calculated various scenarios to ensure he wouldn't get bored in the future, even if it meant killing his own classmates. Tanaka's plan began by using meddling to break the class apart. The next step was to copy everyone's skills with copycat and eliminate any obstacles. Finally, he aimed to copy the plunder skill, which he had already copied to plunder the original. By killing everyone and taking all their skills, he believed he could become the strongest and most perfect being. Tanaka expressed his frustration with Haruka, questioning why he had to stand in his way. During their fierce battle, Tanaka managed to pierce through Haruka's shoulder. Despite this, Tanaka remained confident of his victory. However, Haruka was determined not to give up easily. He pointed out that while Tanaka might excel at calculations, he hadn't put in any effort beyond that. Tanaka had become conceited with his cheat skill and lacked the drive to improve. In contrast, all their classmates were giving their best in this world, except him. Haruka then used his truth and lie skill on Tanaka again and delivered a decisive strike. As he prepared to leave, Haruka asserted that even though he might not possess a cheat skill, he could still find ways to cheat his way through everything. As Tanaka was making his way back, he appeared to be in a severely weakened state. He realized that his fight with Haruka had been intense and even a single wrong move could have cost him his life. The repercussions from using the good-for-nothing skill hit him all at once. He had exhausted all his MP, and the after-effects of the truth and lie skill were taking a toll on him. Unable to endure any longer, he collapsed. At that moment, the geeks found him and reassured him that it was their turn to save him now. Haruka asked the geeks why they had come to the forest, and they explained that when they returned to town, they'd heard rumors about Haruka still fighting there. Unable to simply wait, and decided to search for him. On their way back to the city, they noticed the entire class waiting at the gate for Haruka's return. The girls were visibly relieved to see him alive. For Haruka, who was used to being a loner, seeing so many people together was overwhelming. The athletes praised Haruka for defeating Tanaka. Meanwhile, Shimazuka was hesitant to talk to Oda one of the geeks. With encouragement from her friends, she finally apologized to him. She felt guilty because despite the geeks' efforts in helping them survive, they had still been driven out of the base. However, the geeks were understanding and told her not to apologize. Haruka then decided it was time to return to being a loner, but the class president stopped him. She asked if he had anything to say to her and then hugged him, questioning why he wanted to leave them. She revealed that she had been worried about Haruka wondering if he would ever return. But now she was relieved that he came back alive. In a distant, dark pit, a mysterious being sat alone, patiently waiting for someone to approach. Meanwhile, Haruka woke up from a peculiar dream about a dungeon located somewhere. He was still recovering from the injuries he sustained during the fight with Tanaka. Feeling hungry, he thought about getting something to eat. The geeks then approached him, revealing their plan to explore a labyrinth, which supposedly contained fascinating and valuable items. Haruka found the idea of exploring the labyrinth quite intriguing. Haruka believed that the most important thing for him was to return to his cave now that he had defeated Tanaka and found the geeks and athletes. However, the class president stopped him, saying she needed to talk to him. She confronted him about facing Tanaka alone, as it was too dangerous. She wanted him to stay safe and not engage in such perilous endeavors on his own. Haruka apologized and assured her that he wouldn't take such risks again. The next day, Haruka was determined to explore the labyrinth, wanting to avoid another lecture from the class president. As he set out, he sensed a group of monsters approaching, and it turned out to be a bunch of orcs. They seemed determined not to let him enter the dungeon. Meanwhile, back in the town, Getek announced that the orcs had launched a large-scale invasion, destroying a nearby village, and were heading their way. The guildmaster called upon the adventurers to prepare and defend the town at all costs. The class president decided to assist the guildmaster and wondered where Haruka had gone. Meanwhile, 
Haruka found himself engaged in a battle with a group of orcs as he tried to make his way into the dungeon. At the town's entrance, the guildmaster rallied everyone, urging them to be on high alert. Meanwhile, Haruka had been locked in a fierce battle with the Orc King. Despite the tough fight, Haruka emerged victorious, defeating the entire army of orcs. With the path clear, he finally spotted the entrance to the dungeon and ventured inside. Inside the dungeon, Haruka was impressed by its historical appearance, realizing that many adventurers had journeyed through it in the past. Sensing a tense atmosphere from its depths, he decided to ignore it for now and focus on finding the item that could increase his affinity. After some exploration, Haruka discovered a chest, but found nothing useful inside. It dawned on him that the old man from the shop might possess information about the item he needed. Haruka recalled that most of the items sold in the shop came from the dungeon. Determined to find the item, he resolved to return to the town and speak with the old man first. Meanwhile, the guildmaster and others were puzzled about why the orcs hadn't attacked the town, even after waiting until night. Shimazaki mentioned that she sensed something coming but it turned out to be just Haruka. The class president expressed her concern, explaining that it was dangerous outside due to monsters that had been destroying nearby villages. She clarified that everyone was out there to protect the town from these threats. Haruka then surprised them by revealing that he had already taken care of the orcs, assuming they were the monsters the class president was talking about. The guild master expressed his gratitude for Haruka's actions, but advised him not to engage in such risky behavior again. He explained that monster activities have become more active lately, especially with the ones coming from the dungeon. These monsters tended to appear in large numbers and were more noticeable than others. The guild master anticipated that the monsters might launch a stampede in the near future. After a brief conversation with the others, Haruka made up his mind to head to the shop. The following day, Haruka visited the shop owner who initially didn't want to talk to him since he had nothing to sell. However, Haruka clarified that he wasn't there to make a purchase. Instead, he inquired if the shop owner knew about items that could increase affinity, specifically mentioning the pheromone ring. The shop owner informed him that the rumored ring could be found in a nearby dungeon. Haruka asked for the exact location of the ring, mentioning that he hadn't come across it during his previous exploration of the dungeon. The shop owner replied that it might be in an unexplored area lying below the 50th floor. However, he warned Haruka that he couldn't casually go there. On each floor, there was a powerful boss monster known as the Floor Master, and Haruka needed to defeat it to progress to the next floor, with the bottom floor being the 100th floor. The shop owner warned Haruka to exercise caution, as the dungeon held many mysteries, including the ancient heroic tale and the dungeon emperor. If Haruka intended to explore the dungeon, he needed to be well prepared with suitable items. Meanwhile, one of the geeks overheard Haruka's conversation and informed the class president that Haruka was planning to venture into the dungeon to search for an item known as the pheromone ring. Worried upon hearing this, the class president and everyone else decided to stop Haruka from going into the dungeon. As Haruka made his way towards the dungeon, he noticed that his entire class was following him. They confronted him about going into the dungeon alone to find the pheromone ring. Haruka felt the need to defend himself, stating that he was actually searching for the Solomon ring and not the pheromone ring. However, the class president insisted that they would all be accompanying him. Feeling the pressure of not wanting the class president to obtain the pheromone ring before him, Haruka hurriedly entered the dungeon with the whole group following closely behind. As he continued his progress, Haruka suddenly fell down as he discovered there was no ground beneath him. As Haruka fell, he managed to survive by landing safely on the ground below. He thought he was on the lowest level and noticed a suspicious corridor but chose not to go there. When he tried to go back up through the hole he fell from, it was too small for him to fit. So he decided to test his skills in understanding spaces and sensing traps. He found a long corridor without any traps and saw a big open area ahead. Haruka thought that exploring this new area might help him figure out how to get back to the surface above. As Haruka ventured further into the corridor, he noticed that the air was becoming difficult to breathe. The concentration of magic energy in the corridor was much denser than what he experienced in the forest. All the energy seemed to be converging towards a single point. Nevertheless, Haruka continued on and came across a door at the end of the corridor. Upon opening it, he felt a foreboding and sinister surge of magic energy. Disturbing images flashed through his mind, threatening to overwhelm him. Haruka knew he had to remain vigilant and keep moving forward. It was then revealed that the dark image he witnessed belonged to the 100-level Dark Labyrinth Emperor. Haruka's classmates are searching for him on the 47th floor, but they can't find any trace of him. The girls are growing concerned, but the leader of the athletes assures them that Haruka will be okay. He explains that there's merely a rumor about a dark figure in the ancient labyrinth they are exploring. The guild closely monitors this labyrinth, and even those with cheat skills like them were initially not allowed to explore it. The labyrinth's authority seems to extend even to the labyrinth king boss on the lowest floor who obeys the labyrinth emperor. Seeing that Haruka was always the one who saved them, the girls resolve to rescue him in return. Meanwhile, Haruka attempted to appraise the Dark Emperor, but the process glitched, and he could only see a few stats due to the contacts effect. However, one thing was certain, the Labyrinth Emperor was significantly stronger than Tanaka. He possessed three races, 
the fairy knight Dalian, the highest magician lich, and the immortal middle-life king. This indicated that his skills, magic, techniques, and equipment were all top-notch. Harvika realized that he might not stand a chance in a long-range magic battle and decided to focus on close-range combat instead. Activating his stealth attack, he tried to strike the Dark Emperor, but the enemy dodged and counterattacked swiftly. Undeterred, Haruka analyzed the Dark Emperor's weak spot and expressed determination to uncover the secret behind his incredible speed. In his quest to unravel the mystery behind the Dark Emperor's supersonic speed, Haruka realized he needed to switch to speed mode. Despite his efforts, he found it challenging to keep up with the Dark Emperor and couldn't land a single hit. Determined not to give up, Haruka activated his God's Eye skill, which allowed him to glimpse into the future slightly. However, he understood that even a momentary lapse in focus could lead to disastrous consequences as the Dark Emperor's power was formidable. Therefore, he pushed all distractions aside and focused solely on the battle, resolved to keep fighting all his might. After a tough and tiring battle, Haruka was almost at his limit. He had little energy and magic left. His vision was blurry and he didn't know how much longer he could fight. Surprisingly, the Dark Emperor, who had been perfectly fine, stopped attacking him. Haruka noticed that the Dark Emperor didn't want to kill him at that moment, but he understood that the enemy could end his life easily whenever he wanted. As Haruka bravely attacked the Dark Emperor, he noticed that the Emperor wasn't trying to kill him, even though he could do it easily. The Dark Emperor seemed to be controlled by the shadows and the skeleton itself showed no intent to harm. It was the shadows that were forcing him to fight. During the battle, Haruka's cane started emitting light, and he realized that it wanted to absorb the shadow. He used his cane on the shadow, causing it to vanish. After this, the Dark Emperor appeared unwilling to fight any longer. Haruka then questioned the Dark Emperor, asking if he wanted to die so he could be free from the shadow's curse. The Dark Emperor seemed to prevent the shadow from killing Haruka. Haruka realized that if he spared the Dark Emperor now, the shadow's curse might return to haunt him again. However, he felt sympathy for the Dark Emperor and couldn't bring himself to kill him. Despite everything, the Dark Emperor was just a lonely individual much like Haruka himself. In the end, Haruka chose to embrace the Dark Emperor, showing empathy and understanding rather than taking his life. Haruka sensed no malicious feelings from the Dark Emperor Angelica despite the shocking revelation that she was a girl, not a guy. Deciding to find a way out together, they encountered some stairs that could lead them back to the surface. Haruka knew the monsters would surely block their path, and the thought of fighting them frightened him. He believed he might stand a chance against one monster, but if there were multiple, he wouldn't survive. As predicted, the monsters were drawn to Haruka and began chasing him. However, in the chaos, they accidentally pierced a hole through the floor and fell down. Haruka and Angelica managed to escape their pursuers. The armor they obtained from the defeated monsters was handed to Angelica, but it was too big for her. Surprisingly, the armor adjusted itself to perfectly fit Angelica's size. After some time, Haruka sensed the presence of someone else, who turned out to be a lich. The lich was resistant to physical attacks and only holy magic could harm it. Remembering his previous encounter with the Labyrinth Emperor, Haruka believed his wood cane might be effective against creatures like the lich. To his relief, the wood cane indeed worked on the lich. As they progressed further, Haruka used his fire magic to fend off a swarm of moths, followed by a group of caterpillars. As they reached the 95th floor, both Haruka and Angelica sensed a formidable enemy nearby and prepared for a battle. The floor was littered with swords and suddenly, the boss of the 95th floor revealed himself before them. And that's how the first part of this manhwa ends. Well guys, if you like this video and you want a second part, comment below with the word part 2, also subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, and like the video. But most important, leave a comment. Until the next video.